I'm now talking to Jimmy Yuga, founder of the Jimmy Yuga Foundation. I admire you tremendously. I think you've done a tremendous job with the Jimmy Yuga Foundation. In the ski industry, you have a world famous Jimmy Yuga Express. Could you elaborate and talk a little bit about that? What the Ski Express does is uh, underwrite our medical research and scholarship activities. It, it involves co ed teams of three who compete against each other for at a designated ski area, which we run these events in 19 cities and 30 areas around the country, but a trail will be uh, isolated off, and they know the vertical footage from top to bottom, and and the co-ed team will compete against each you know other teams for the most vertical footage uh, ski during a given period of time, let's say three or four hours. And it's a combination of the vertical footage ski, the funds raised, and the uh, aggregate time in a dual slalom that they compete in. That, um, and the winners from these uh, events come to the finals every April to compete uh, in these grand finals, which is a wonderful event because we have uh, Olympic and world champions who come in who, as a fourth member of that co-ed team to serve as uh, player coaches. And, uh, you know, we'll have about uh, 35 teams uh, That's incredible. come to the finals, and it's a nice affair. Now I have to ask you a very off-the-wall question here, Jimmy. We've been asking a lot of people here, and that is, could you tell me your interpretation of the word shushing? Shushing? Yes. Uh, we're going straight down the hill, I suppose. I'm sure when you were doing uh, the Olympic skiing and so forth, you probably did that many times. We, we did this, uh, certainly. Now, so another very difficult question is, you were probably also a ski hound. And could you tell me, what kind of sounds do the, comes from, what would you do if you were a ski hound? What kind of sounds would you make? You really throw me, but uh, we would shriek to the... Uh, would you like to try this? Well, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Jimmy, thank you so much for your time. I admire you. I admire your foundation, what you've done for the skiing industry, and what you've done for the state of Colorado. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. I'm now talking to Margo Eaton, who just actually came off the hill, she told me. How was skiing today, by the way? Well, I only made one run. I've been working in the Finnish area as the Finnish referee for the World Cup. Margo, you've been in the officiating area for over 30 years now. Yes. Tell me a little bit about what changes have you seen in the officiating over these past 30 years? Well, I think, as with many things, it's become a little more structured. Um, there's been a big change in the rules. The rules evolve constantly. They change every year, but it's uh, we had major changes this year. Our primary concern at this point in time is the protection of the racer and um, get providing a safe course, a fair course, and hopefully having no no accidents and just having them have a good, fair, oh, safe place, safe com yeah. competition, and have fun doing it. Now I understand. You, this past year, just a few months ago, you were inducted into this Hall of Fame, is that I was true? inducted in 19, 1992. A few years ago. C Two, couple. A couple years ago. <laughs> what does that mean to you? Well, I was, I'll tell you, it was a surprise of my life. It was about the last thing I ever expected to have happen because um, there's so many people in skiing who've done so very much. And I was just, when I was told I was being inducted, I really, I didn't believe it for a couple of days. <laughs> But it's, to me, it's, it's the greatest honor I've ever had. And I'm with, in with an amazing company of skiers and ski area builders. And I, I just, you know. Margo, for what you have done for the industry, you well deserved it. Thank you so much for your time today. I know you've been busy with the World Cup here. And we hope to see you again. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you, Chen. You're going to help me do I'm going to help you do that. <laughs> Get excited. <laughs> Get I'm going to have to no, add women, aren't What's happening right now is Dick is doing exactly what he didn't want to do. Uh, add web, but we'll add, add web. And meeting people that he didn't even know he was going to interview. Oh. Happens to me so often. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you are the newly elected president of the yeah. Colorado Ski Museum. Okay. That's me. You ready? Cool. That's all Got you need to know. That's all you need to know. Okay. I'm now very honored to talk to Charles Duke, who is the newly elected president of the Colorado Ski Museum. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about the Ski Museum, how long it's been here, what the purpose is, and so forth? What's your job responsibilities? Well, I've just been uh, named the president uh, after uh, 
very long period of support and leadership from uh, Bob Johnstone, who has been wonderful for the organization. And uh, it's important to know that uh, uh, the museum was started as part of the Colorado Bicentennial in 19 or eight, yeah, 1976. And uh, uh, part of our centennial activities associated with the U.S. Bicentennial. And it was started by a very dedicated group of people and, and continues to grow in its enthusiasm and uh, helping people further understand the legacy of skiing in Colorado, understand the, um, the, the sports uh, importance in the economics of the state of Colorado and, and also understand uh, why it is that we all love it so much. And now, you, you emphasize one thing there, too. You emphasize the state of Colorado. This is not just for local ski skiers. This is for the state of Colorado. Oh, no. This is uh, the support for this museum comes from all over the state, uh, from you know north and Steamboat and south and Purgatory and Telluride, and, and obviously including Denver and, mm -hmm. and all urban areas as well. Now, Charles, I want you to tell me about your most memorable fall skiing that you ever had. <laughs> Uh, I guess it would have to be, I don't fall. You don't fall, okay. Well, you can tell us about <laughs> the most memorable sliding that you ever did. No, I've fallen a lot of times and, and uh, I blacked them all out. You, you blacked them all out. Yeah. Now, there is a sound. You are probably a early morning riser. You get out there when the snow first comes down. These great powder, you're probably a powder hound yourself. Now, a, a lot of people when they're a powder hound make a sound. Could you give us an example of if you're coming down early in the morning with this fresh, beautiful snow, what kind of sound would you make? That's, that's, that's my sound. That, that's the sound. <laughs> Not even I a yippee. <laughs> Not <laughs> even a yippee. At the end, uh, it's more. <laughs> <laughs> we have it here. He is pounding here. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard work, but I don't yet. There you go. <laughs> the beautiful facilities you yeah. have up here, congratulations on your being newly elected president. Yeah, one of the things that I think is really exciting here and, and something that look forward to as we move forward as a museum is the kinds of exhibits which really get people involved in understanding the sport. And one of them is obviously this virtual reality machine that is uh, coming here. It is uh, designed to simulate uh, running a downhill. And uh, we think that is a kind of hands-on exhibit that uh, separates this museum from some of the other museums in the... Could you elaborate a little bit on, is this a headset you put on, or is it a... What it is, is a it? combination. It's a, it? You wear both a headset uh, with all the... Uh, paraphernalia. Paraphernalia, and, and also you have a, um, uh, boards and, and uh, simulating the skis and, and the various motions as you're skiing down the hill. So it's very uh, uh, unique equipment that uh, I think uh, three or four such machines in the entire country and we'll have one of them here and uh, now where, where are you getting this from actually uh, from uh, uh, Lake Placid an individual up there that builds them. and uh, so that's very exciting and some of the other things we do are interpretive uh, exhibits so which go well beyond um, simply showing old skis and some of the old equipment the history the artifacts mm -hmm. but Helping uh, people understand the the interrelationship between public lands and skiing, and and uh, and the stewardship of those public lands, and how skiing uh, affects that, and various other interpretive exhibits, which really help people really uh, fully understand our. So it's a really a full round touch and hands on experience you have here. It's just not a history museum. Exactly, and and uh, we'd like to get more and more people here, but. Because not everybody can come to Vail, we uh, are beginning a process of putting together both traveling uh, exhibits as well as uh, speakers bureaus that will go throughout the, the state, including Denver and various other destination resorts. Charles, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, you say 14 years. I've been president for 14 years. I'll do it that and way. This okay. year, we just set up a new category of chairman of the board. We'll, we'll so, so, so I get to that category. Okay. Go ahead and do the intro, Dick, and we can end Okay. okay. Sure. Now I'm with Bob Johnstone, who's the former president of the Colorado Ski Museum. You've been with the museum now for 14 years as president, is that true? That, that is correct, yes. What changes have you seen? You have to put a lot of hard work and effort in the museum here today. It's a beautiful facility. What changes have evolved over the years? Well, we had the unique little building down in the center of town. Remember that? Across from the fire, fire station. station. And, and they finally didn't force us out of it, but virtually so. And uh, when did you move here 
in this location. This is about four years, and we've been here now. You have a lot more room here, too, as I understand. We, we have more room here. It's, it's more uh, visible. I think it'll be a great place. It takes time to do everything. You're right at the transportation center. Plenty of parking here, right in almost the center of town. That's what a phenomenal facilities. I'm sure you had a lot to do with it. Well, I, I've had a lot of good people helping me. What do you see for the future of this museum? Well, I think it has a great future. I think it's, it's this type of history has to be preserved. Uh, we have some different ideas. Rather than be strictly a museum, we want it to be a more action type of place where that they can come in and actually touch things and see it happen. Mm -hmm. I understand you are getting a virtual reality downhill ski simulator coming that, up. That is correct. And there's other, other types of reality pieces of equipment that, mm -hmm. if this proves successful, we may be talking about getting winners. Bob, there's a, there's a question I want to ask you, and that is, you probably skied many, many years in many, many different places, correct? That's right, yes. Now, you were probably a powder hound, right? Well, <laughs> I, I started when all we had was a couple rope toes out here. Being a powder hound, when you started many years ago, what kind of sound does a powder hound make going down that first slope? Well, you don't make any sounds. I mean, in those days, why, uh, we used to go to Bertha Pass. That's the only place around out of Denver that you could ski. I uh, helped put up the first rope toe up there. No kidding. And uh, then I served for 43 years on the Winter Park Board as vice chairman of that, and I retired from that two years ago. That's incredible. Bob, thank you so much for your time. I know there's a lot of history with the museum here, but also a lot of history of you here in this museum. Well, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a real challenge, lots of fun. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Bob. See you. In about 12 years old, I started skiing, and it was really due to the films I saw by Warren Miller, so I'm very pr privileged to interview Mr. Warren Miller. Thank you. In, in route, from when you were 12 till now, I don't know how many years that is. I'm 21 right now. You're 21. <laughs> right. Well, in those nine years, we've screwed up a lot of people's <laughs> lives. <laughs> Not really. You mentioned, I was talking to you a little bit earlier, and you mentioned, I think the one thing your films do is show us the not only the creativity but the freedom that that skiing gives us. Well, I think that uh, I was using. I always ask people if they can remember the first time they ever went skiing. If they did that before, after they were five years old, they can remember that first day. Every single thing about it, where they went, the clothes they wore, what the weather was like, what they had for lunch, and any event in their life that is that monumental has to be have some deep-seated psychosis, and. They can always remember that, mm -hmm. and, and I always just simplify it and use the word freedom. And the pioneers here in Colorado wanted that freedom. You know, they came when they when the people got off the Mayflower, Boston got crowded. They moved on west. Denver got crowded, and they came up into the mountains looking for freedom. And as we stand here in this museum and think about freedom and think about the history and how much of skiing as it is today was invented in this state, if you will. Uh, you know, we can just, I don't want to discount ski racing, it was a very vital part of it, but some of the real pioneers were here. Aspen, Colorado, for example, uh, first chairlift in Colorado in 47, and when Pete Seibert and the guys got together and bought the whole Vale Valley for the Vale Rod and Gun Club and built probably the premier resort in the world, and now the, the museum, obviously, in my opinion, rightly belongs here, and with the current state of the art for ski equipment, it's really revealing to come in here and see what it used to be like. You know, two years ago, our camera crew equipped some of the best skiers in the world today with some of this 1945, 46, 47 ski equipment. They were Stowe, Vermont, or pardon me, they were Mont Tremblant. They couldn't even turn right and left on that equipment. And to think that these guys did this and not only pioneered it, you know, when I started, they hadn't invented the nylon parka yet. Safety bindings were unheard of. All the things that we take for granted today, the high-speed chairlift has never even been thought of till about 10 years ago. And the rope tow, a parking spot in a muddy parking lot is what you had. It's all on display here in this Colorado Museum at Vail. And I think anybody that comes through this part of the world who is the least bit interested in skiing and doesn't stop by and see what they have on display so that they can learn more about their heritage and what a wonderful time they have 
because of these pioneers, I think they're really missing a bet. Warren, you're talking about the history of the museum here, but you had a lot to do with it too. The films you've been doing over the years, getting people excited about skiing and so forth. Let me ask you a personal question. What can we expect from Warren Miller in the future? Well, I just finished writing a book. It's called Warren Miller on Film in Print. And I did that for a lot of reasons, because in the 45 years I've been making films and the five years I lived in parking lots and kind of bummed around in the ski resorts, I had a million experiences. And very few of those ever got put down on film. So now I wrote a book of about, I don't know, 45 or 50 of those experiences. And uh, they sell them here in the museum, of course. It's called On Film in Print, Warren Miller On Film in Print. And I think that you're going to find more writing, more, more drawings, more cartoons, more a lot of stuff. Good. Warren, thank you so much for stopping thank by. You. You've certainly been a night of little mine, and I'll continue skiing, and thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'm now talking to Jerry Groswell, who's the president of Winter Park, also in the Hall of Fame with the Colorado Ski Museum and the National Hall of Fame. Winter Park, I'm going to concentrate on that at the beginning here, is world where you're known for the handicap skiing. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. The uh, disabled program at uh, Winter Park is in its 25th year. Uh, we actually founded it on the premise that we were going to provide some fun and games for some disadvantaged children out of Denver. And it's now grown to a program that is the largest of its kind in the world. Uh, what we are in fact doing is giving people an opportunity to rebuild their lives. Everybody that comes there has uh, a disability as a result of a very serious illness, a birth defect, or a very traumatic accident. And uh, it's a unique program and one that uh, we get a lot from and we think gives a lot of people a great amount, great amount of pleasure. How did you get involved in this in the first place? What made you decide to do handicap skiing like you're doing? We actually got into the program as a result of a phone call. Um, I had a, a, a sister of a fellow that I went to law school with who uh, was involved with Children's Hospital in their auxiliary. And she called one night and said that they were running this program and they were operating in another ski area that had a very high base and it was cold and difficult for them to operate from and uh, ask if they could come to Winter Park. And without really thinking about it, I thought, sure, we can, we can do that. It's a program that has now grown from 23 kids skiing eight days the first year to a program where we'll see between uh, 2,500 and 3,500 people this year with uh, 45 disabilities, and we'll teach somewhere in the neighborhood of about 22,000 lessons. That's incredible. I congratulate you for doing all the work you're doing. Now I'm going to concentrate a little bit about you're, at, you're in the Ski Hall of Fame here. You're also in the National Ski Hall of Fame. What does that mean to you? Well, it's a, it very frankly, it's a great honor. It uh, is somewhat unique in the sense that uh, uh, my father, my brother, and I are here in the Colorado Hall of Fame, and my father and I are both in the National Hall of Fame. It's a unique honor, uh, a unique honor in the sense that when you can get recognized for being active in a sport that you love, working in an environment that you love, with people that you love, uh, it's a pretty unique opportunity. Jerry, thank you so much for taking the time today. We look forward to seeing you again. And thank you for all the help you've been doing the handicapped skiers. Not at all. It's our pleasure. Thank you. I'm now very honored to talk to Dick Over. Dick Over is on the executive committee with the Colorado Ski Museum here. And mo even more important than I think, you were one of the original tenth involved with the 10th Mountain Division in Colorado here. Yeah, uh, Dick, I was, I'm now known as the old guy <laughs> the in the 10th Mountain Division. <laughs> yeah, um, but th through the 10th Mountain Division, it really helped put skiing in the, the limelight worldwide. It really did. After the war, so many of us had to had all that expert ski training from just a few, uh, primarily uh, Austrian fellows that came over and uh, trained us in uh, ski technique and also how to manage in, in uh, wartime, how to survive, really. Bob Parker and Pete Seiber, Steve Knowlton and that whole crew. And uh, then we came back after the war and we were still, uh, although uh, the story is that we never wanted to see those torture boards again. <laughs> we, uh, we managed to uh, come back and put the boards on. And, and uh, the other thing that helped was a great deal of surplus Army equipment. You know, those old seven-foot white skis that we had. Uh, they were in many surplus houses, and uh, so were the jackets and the boots. And, you know, today I meet people riding up the lift uh, people almost my generation to say, I learned to ski on those old white skis. <laughs> and I laugh and say, well, so did we. We had nothing else. And today, of course, the, uh, the new equipment and the development. And that's another thing that the tent fellows did. Uh, the development of ski equipment 
uh, was largely done by uh, fellows from the Tenth Mountain, Johnny Woodward, uh, who had uh, was with AT and T, uh, and oh, the fellows that developed helped develop the early uh, ski equipment and the jackets and parkas from the Sierra Club. They all had a hand in uh, in developing the. Uh, Equipment and the clothing and mm -hmm. things that, after the war, helped make skiing a a uh, a fun thing. Unlike the times that we had during the war, where it was a case of survival. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there, you've, been, uh, yeah. you've been very much involved with the ski museum here. You mentioned you were on the executive board here, and you mentioned a few minutes ago, which I thought was pretty interesting, that some of the artifacts you have on display here are actually yours. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, right over here is our diorama. And uh, on the other side, so, uh, on the other side here, and a lot of this equipment that's here is mine. Uh, Point the, of the, what, what? The, white, the white mucklucks that are here are mine. The uh, the skins, the white skins are mine. I was in the signal detachment at that time. It was called the 110th Mountain Signal Company, and the radio or the uh, tele telephone that's hanging on the tree there is to simulate that this. Rucksack. Association after the war. Uh, bunny boots are interesting yep. because those. What are bunny boots? Bunny boots are those white felt boots that uh, were developed after the war. Or uh, I have. To, I'm sorry. It Before, wasn't during the war. During the war, so that we could take those ski boots off during the uh, night when we were bivouacking, and uh, we could wear those around the uh, around the compound, the area, around the outpost. And uh, so they, we called them bunny boots. They looked like, like a big uh, snow bunny boots. And, uh, so Dick, I have to ask you a question. Sure. You probably have got up early in the morning and skied over the years and going this white powdered puff snow and come down a mountain all by yourself and so forth. What kind of sounds did you make when you came down and first saw that white powder? <laughs> well, after the war, there were squeals of joy. But uh, <laughs> during the war, you know, it was a little different. Uh, we crawl out of that sleeping bag and uh, we were in the tents like they're over here and uh, the, uh, our breath had condensed on the roof of the tent during the night and we'd get a shower of cold snow and uh, we crawled out and we were lucky if our ski boots were anything pliable. Uh, they were heavy leather and we'd take them into the sleeping bag with us at night to keep them warm so they weren't completely frozen. And to put those cold ski boots on in the morning and then crawl out and then we have a, a bit of a breakfast that the cooks had prepared for us. Uh, uh, and then get onto the skis and, and uh, into some kind of a formation. And they'd set out a program for us during the day to uh, uh, simulate battle. And uh, it, was, uh, it was not the pleasantest time, particularly on miserable cold days. But it wasn't a Yahoo. It wasn't a Yahoo. <laughs> yeah. well, after the war, when we hit that powder, uh, that's when the Yahoos came. There out. you go. Yeah. Dick, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so well, much. Thank you, and Dick. It's been a pleasure. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you.
Okay. I am the new director of the Colorado. Sleep ever since. Yeah, really sleepy, sleepy. I'm the new director of the Colorado Ski Museum, and we are very excited to be embarking upon um, a variety of new endeavors and. We are excited to be embarking upon a, a variety of new endeavors and new plans for the Colorado Ski Museum in an effort to make a major outreach to the not only the Vale Valley but the entire state of Colorado. Um, the Colorado Ski Museum was begun in 1976 by a group of local Colorado longtime skiers who felt that they wanted to preserve and interpret the history of skiing. Such people like Pete Seibert, Bob Parker, Earl, Earl Clark. And the museum began in a little building, in an old telephone building in Vail. And it moved over in, and was situated there for the first 13 years of its existence. For the last several years, it's been in the Vail Transportation Center located at the base of Bridge Street and the very cent center of town. It's easy accessible to the bus route and the, the parking structure and it's really a great facility with about 3,000 square feet. Currently in the museum we have a, a variety of exhibits. Um, we have a very strong exhibit from the 10th Mountain Division and it is a um, depicts the history of the World War II and the 10th Mountaineers who crossed the Italian border. It also, we also have a um, U.S. United States Serv Forestry Service display, which depicts the birth of a ski resort with little vignettes of the birth of a ski resort, an avalanche run. Can you that? Yeah. <laughs> we have the United States Forestry Service display, which has a series of two or three minute vignettes, which shows how an avalanche is created and formed. It shows the development of a ski area as well as several other various mini movies which helps the visitor experience and understand what the Forestry Service does for the state of Colorado and how important it really is to the ski industry. We have two mini theaters with videos that we play through a variety of videos throughout the day. Um, we have a a, an exhibit of the current Colorado-based ski industry people, and it is an attempt to involve the, the Colorado-based ski industry companies with the museum, and they have a, each have a mini exhibit and display their current day products and gives a little history on, their, on the background of their company. Is it like Volant? Yes, like a Volant, Volant is one of the companies, and Bole, and Keeley and Nevica. And this has been a popular display. It helps the, it's a win-win situation. It helps the ski industry companies with the center, again, a central place on the base of Bridge Street and Vale, as well as it, it helps integrate them with the, the past and the future of skiing. One of the things that we are embarking upon is a, is becoming proactive and aggressive in the Colorado ski community. Not only do we want to preserve and maintain the integrity and the history of skiing, we want to reach outward and forward and, and look into the future and be an exciting, entertaining place to visit for young and old. We are very excited to have just received a major, major corporate contribution from the Coors Brewing Company. They have been most generous in, as our in, in helping to fund us for the future projects. For the future projects. <laughs> Thank you. They have initially given us some money to, as seed money, to get our marketing programs in place, to get some collateral materials printed, to help us create more exposure for ourselves, both in the Vale Valley and primarily statewide, so people know where we are, what we're all about, and why, what we're trying to achieve. The Coors money will also, some of it will go to, the majority of it, of the Coors money will go to new hands-on interpretive type displays which are educational for the visitor. We intend to have a virtual reality downhill simulator 
which is a visual depiction, and you will experience a, an actual downhill ski race. We intend to have a traveling display, which would go off site from the museum and travel around the state to inform and educate the rest of the state on what our little museum has to offer. Anybody who has a love for the mountains and a love for skiing can certainly enjoy the Colorado Ski Museum. It is a wonderful place for young and old alike to visit and learn and reminisce. And We're back. <laughs> Live from the Colorado Ski Museum. <laughs> and the Colorado Ski Museum is, is privately funded. We are, our primary sources of funding come from our membership categories and we have a variety of categories with some interest. Anybody who becomes a member will get a free issue of Ski and Skiing Magazine, for example. We have all different levels and, and we have some, some attractive benefits and we'd encourage it any anybody to join and participate in our organization. We have a gift shop in our museum. It specializes in unique items, not to compete with the local merchants, but to to offer a variety of ski related goods in the way of jewelry. Um, we have a, a great deal of books for sale. Um, a lot of them are signed by the author, Warren Miller books, um, June Simonton's Veil, Veil history book. We have Frida Pfeiffer's book. All of these are signed by the authors. We have a very extensive collection of 10th Mountain Division merchandise. It is very, it is impossible to purchase anywhere else and we have books and pins and and clothing that is very suitable for anybody who's interested in the 10th Mountain Division at all and as a it's very unaccessible you, you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot find 10th Mountain Division memorabilia in new items um, and replications anywhere else in the museum is we're, we're known for that in our merchandise okay. department we have a series of events throughout the year which help our funding processes. We ha host the Beaver Creek Home Tour annually. We have a golf tennis tournament annually. We are embarking on plans for a ski race annually, which is very fitting for the Colorado Ski Museum. We are have the, the, the museum host is also the museum is the home of the Colorado Ski Hall of Fame. We have approximately 99 inductees. We host a induction banquet in Denver every October to induct the new members. It's a very sentimental uh, popular event and it is certainly a very great fundraiser for us. We also rent out the museum for parties. It's a very unique, interesting setting for a cocktail reception or we can do small meetings and we've even done breakfast before people, media, meeting planners go out to ski. It is, offers a unique setting with a variety, obviously, of it offers a variety of galleries and exhibits and pictures for people to look at and experience and especially for group functions where people may not know each other it's a great way to mix and mingle and, and get to know each other and have some conversation pieces to talk about and we are really striving to you may want to put this back with the other <laughs> membership piece but you That's in our membership good. department you we are striving to double our membership numbers we have about 200 act active members at this time, we have about 200 active members at this time, and we are striving to double that number. And it's an aggressive plan, but we think that uh, and encourage any anyone to join and, and participate. Another. What about artifacts? Okay, the artifacts we have approximately 30 percent of our collection on display right now. We have two storage areas with a variety of other artifacts. We are always looking for new new items to add to our collection. Um, they can be used as a tax write-off and, and, and as a donation to a nonprofit. Um, we, again, if you, if you have any old items that you'd like to donate that you think would be an asset to our museum, we would love to have them. 
Um, um, the Ski Museum is a Colorado 501c3 nonprofit organization which is striving to to become more of an asset to the entire state of Colorado. We survive on volunteers and participation from throughout the state and we would in we would invite you to join us in any one of our programs, whether it be special events. We have volunteers who come in and man our gift shop for us. We have volunteers who sort through our collections and our artifacts in the area of, of cataloging and storing and cleaning. And we have we are always in need of volunteers for our special events. And please feel free to give us a call at 303-476-1876 if you're able or willing to participate or know of anybody who is. Okay, uh, let's see, what else? We currently, we have a newsletter which we mail to all of our man members on our mailing list which, which will keep you updated on our programs and events. We are in a restructuring er phase of the museum. We are revitalizing, we are growing and expanding. We are looking for help and and ideas and would invite anyone to join us as we begin to climb the ladder to whatever <laughs> <laughs> better better scratch that i'll leave that for the kids yeah right. oh great <laughs> one of the goals of the museum is to become more family oriented and have more displays that kids can actually touch and feel and enjoy and experience we want to make it a fun, interactive place where people can come and enjoy and be entertained as well as learn something and and feel like they've accomplished something after they've been there. We are striving to, we are constantly striving to change our exhibits and displays with the majority of our collection in storage. We feel we can change the look and the feel of the museum every six months or so and make it cha ever-changing and ever-evolving into a, a greater place. Another one of our plans for the future is to become more computerized and have more hands-on interactive computer type machines. One of the one of the programs would be a computer that would bring up every ski area in Colorado and with a picture of the trail map and an phone numbers for reservations and information on every single ski area in Colorado and offer a service to the visitor who comes to the Colorado Ski Museum. Because we're located right off I-70 in the central part of the state, it is an ideal location for anybody who seeks knowledge on, on other ski areas in Colorado. We would intend to work more closely with Colorado Ski Country USA and become more involved in their programs and be a, a vehicle which they can use to, again, help promote and educate the visitor with what the differences are between the various ski areas. I'm the daughter of a 10th Mountaineer and have a little bit of that blood and that... No, I don't want to say that. <laughs> no, I don't want to say that. Oh. I, I moved here from Vermont approximately four years ago, and I'm the daughter of a 10th Mountaineer who instilled in me at a very young age the, the love and the importance of skiing. We came out as children for all of the 10th Mountain reunions, and it, it certainly has grown on me as an adult now. I have done a lot of ski racing and have felt that when the opportunity to become the director came up, I decided that it was a great opportunity to get some younger blood and to carry on the tradition and, and love of the sport of skiing for everybody in Colorado and we're hoping that everybody will jump on the bandwagon and join us as we move forward. <laughs> that's enough. That's good. That's, plenty. that's good. That's great. Because, you know, I mean, I can, can't really be specific about our future plans except for the traveling exhibit, the um, traveling display, you know, some of these computer oriented things, change, rotating, changing the exhibits, and just creating more exposure for ourselves and, and becoming a little more well known in, throughout the state. Mm -hmm. And really showing. Right. It's 
Colorado Ski Museum, but it's located in Vail. We're not subsidized by the town of Vail or the, town, the mountain or anything else. <laughs>